That's what this is all about, is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the God's children. Welcome to Speaking Freely. I'm Ken Paulson, and this is Rosie Flores. We're gonna rock and roll and be bop, a boogie woogie on the dancing floor. I get dizzy when he spins me round, I run my fingers through his pompadour. When the band starts jumping, whoo, we bow to lose control. It's when his heart starts pumping, he says, rock him down inside his soul. Cause I'm his rockin' little angel, little angel, rockin' little angel, a little angel, rockin' little angel, gonna rock him up to heaven tonight. Rockin' little angel, thank the Lord above, a rockin' little angel for a thing called love. A rockin' little angel, gonna rock him up to heaven with us today, Rosie Flores. Thank you. Great to have you here. Good to be here, Ken. For those who, who don't know Rockabilly, mm -hmm. uh, how would you describe it? Well, it's a blend that came from uh, early rhythm and blues. You know, people like Elvis and Wanda and all the people that I've met that grew up around that time used to listen to a lot of radio. And uh, there, were, there were the black music. They called it race records back then. And the rhythm and blues stuff that was coming out. And, you know, Sun Records was the... Uh, kind of the bone, the backbone behind Rockabilly out of Memphis, Tennessee. They used to have the early black musicians. I mean, that's really all they recorded was the black musicians in those days. And uh, people like Helen Wolf and uh, Hard Rock Gunther. And so uh, Sam Phillips was looking for a white man that could sing like that because he thought, that, hey, this would really be cool. So when Elvis came along, this hillbilly from Tupelo, Mississippi, he kind of joined this this thing together and, and you know, started doing the... Well, you know, doing that kind of thing. And he really put his black influence and, and soul behind this hillbilly music. And, and, you know, at the time, they actually weren't really labeling it rockabilly. They were calling it just rock and roll. And the, the term kind of came into existence a little bit later on after, it, you know, it kind of gone on and... Yeah, England really got behind it almost before the Americans did. They used to idolize people like Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran and uh, the Burnett Brothers Trio. And um, there was this whole craze going on over there that I heard about in my young years when I was in uh, high school when I first discovered Wanda Jackson. And um, they were really kind of hip to it before... You know, because we sort of, we moved on, the Americans moved on, we went into the Beatles and the Beach Boys and into, you know, that whole other music. And uh, oddly enough, the Beatles were huge fans. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but they were 
so into rockabilly. They used to have black leather jackets and, and cowboy boots, you know, and I have this great picture of them with their, their jeans tucked into their cowboy boots. So, yeah. So, when did the bug hit you? How old were you when you first heard rockabilly and fell well, in love? I, had the, well, I was about six and a half, seven years old. My, my big brother took me by the hand, and we heard some music going on down the street where my grandmother lived in San Antonio, and so we went, let's go hear that. It sounds like a band, and so we went and and I was just like, ah, oh. you know, looking up at these guys that were playing guitar and drums, and they were so cute with the hair slicked back, and, and we stayed in there for an hour. My mother had to come find us. <laughs> and uh, I think that that was where I really started getting a fever for live bands, you know, and I never thought I'd be in one at the time, you know. I never thought about playing guitar until, you know, I was 15. Then it, it hit me after the Beatles and and Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, folk music, I wanted to play and sing those songs. So I really just started on acoustic and joined a band later. Well, you've got a song um, about the Sun Records days, and I wonder if you could share that today. Oh, sure, that, that'd be it. It came from Memphis, okay. a song I wrote with my good friend Julian Dawson, who's out of England. And uh, he was telling me about the day that he was born was the day they cut That's All Right Mama. So uh, this is how the song starts out. <laughs> so hot that it'll burn your feet a revelation's coming we didn't have a clue between Marshall and Manassas down on Union Avenue a sound so alarming it'll stop the clock it knocked us sideways like an electric shock it came from Memphis Rock and roll shoes, the wayward son of the hillbilly blues. Faster than a heartache, hotter than sin, or louder than a blast of natural glycerin. He came from Memphis. Yeah, they all came from Memphis. Came from Memphis, Tennessee. Former, you're also a scholar. Uh, you, you've studied the music, and, and uh, I'm curious. You know, back in 1954, that was the first time Elvis was actually censored. The 
Juvenile Delinquency Commission in Houston, oh, uh, wow. the band Good Rockin' Tonight, a classic yeah. rockabilly song. Great song. And, and of course, throughout the 50s, there were controversies about rock and roll. Uh, Bill Haley and the Comets were a band from Newark at one point, not, not exactly a rock and billy band, but mm -hmm. some of the same roots. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think it is that caused parents and government authorities to be afraid of early rock and roll, to try to censor and suppress it? Well, it, it was all about, you know, wild sex, I think. <laughs> <laughs> is that what well, it is? Well, I think that it drove the girls, I think it made, you know, like when, when Elvis came out and did the way he swung his hips. It was just so sexual, and, and it just would turn any girl on. And I think it, in some ways, even turned the guys on, you know, and they wanted to be him, you know. And I think that that was really threatening to the Ozzy and Harriet type of families that were around in those days. And uh, uh, unlike my parents, who thought it was cool, so that I never had that. You know, my parents were very, they gave me a lot of freedom. Uh, they kept a tight leash on me at the same time, but I was able to express myself, dress any way I wanted to, and, you know, practice in the garage with my band or whatever, but I was one of the lucky ones, I'll have to say. Uh, thanks, Mom and Dad. When you, uh, when you began performing, uh, mm -hmm. you, you had a kind of a rockabilly bent even then, uh, early on? Well, it was, um, it was rockabilly leaning more toward the Everly Brothers and Ricky Nelson in those days, because I was, I was kind of all about trying to do songs that were real melodic, and, and I, I hadn't found my footing as a guitarist yet. So I, was kinda, I started there, which was kind of a, my influences were Flying Burrito Brothers, uh, Poco, like country rock kind of bands, and, and I kind of blended that together with the, the Everly Brothers and Bob Dylan stuff, and, and so I kind of thought of my, my first band when I was 16 as a folk rock, country rock band, you know. And um, I used to wear, like, the cowboy boots and the fringe and all that. And so I, had, I was really strongly influenced by the Buffalo Springfield, I think. That, that was our kind of look. Uh, but it was an all-girl band, actually. We were called Penelope's Children out of San Diego. And we used to win all kinds of... Uh, ba back then, they had Battles of the Bands. Do you remember that? Oh, sure. That was like a thing that happened in those days and uh, we won a couple times so it gave us a lot of encouragement and my father uh, uh, signed for a bunch of gear for us and we, we worked hard to pay it off but he put his signature down so we could get some gear and be a band you know. You were heard first as a solo artist in the mid 80s right? You signed to Warner Brothers? Yeah and that was 86 I had my first record and uh, I had I'd been playing little honky tonks in San Diego and LA since about Oh, around 1976, I guess, I started fronting bands and just doing every country song I could ever, the most essential country songs, you know, that were popular to me. And it was, those were the good old days when you could actually play those songs and they weren't requesting something off of Urban Cowboy or something. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that, po it was like country before country was cool in some ways, you know. So that first album was very well received. You took a little bit of a risk on that record, uh, recording a Harlan Howard song that others did. didn't dare touch. This was like the coolest thing. I don't know if anybody, well, I'm sure other people have gotten to do this, but I don't know anybody else besides me and my manager at the time, Tracy Gershon, were invited over to Harlan's house for sandwiches. So he, he was so cute, he had his little sandwich board out there and he made us our sandwiches. Would you like turkey or beef, you know? And so we put our sandwiches together and we sat in his living room and he had this reel-to-reel. -reel. That was back when they had reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. It was 1985. And he said, um, no, no, excuse me, 86. And he said, I would like to play you some songs. And he, that was the first one he played, God May Forgive You But I Won't. And it was, it was recorded beautifully by um, a singer that was, I think she was known for doing demo singing. I, don't, I really don't know her name. But that song just hit me and grabbed me. And I said, I, I want that one. <laughs> Does anybody else have that one? And he said, no, everybody's turned it down. He said, even Reba McIntyre turned it down because they thought it was a little too risky to sing, you know, and I said, well, the, I don't have any problem singing God May Forgive You, but I won't. So um, it, it should have been a single, it really should have, because it, it ended up being everybody's favorite song on the record. So shall I play it for you? Please. All right. <laughs> Co-written with Bobby Braddock. He 
Say that you're born again Cleansed up your former sins You want me to say I'll forgive and forget But you've done too much to me Don't you be touching me Go back and touch all those women you've met kids used to cry for you and I had to try and do things that a dad should do since you were gone now you really let us down I wrote it. <laughs> well, you had this opportunity, really, to uh, to work with people uh, you've loved all your life, and, and Harlan yeah. Howard would be an example. That's somebody who is oh. the legendary Nashville songwriter. But you I'm had kidding. this uh, CD called Rockabilly Philly, mm -hmm. which uh, on which you appeared with Wanda Jackson and Janice Martin. Well, these are two young women who, in the late well, mid to late fifties, just exploded on the scene and yeah. and recorded this kind of music music that young women didn't record. Right. Mm -hmm. Talking about, you know, feeling feeling your sexual side and uh, talking about heartbreak. and But uh, Wanda Jackson in particular seemed to be so tantalizing with the stuff she was recording, you know. You're a mean, mean man, you know, and stuff like that. So. And so on this CD, you brought them back to record with you. and, and uh, I did. And, it was and really fun. Talk about that. What, what was that experience like? Janice, when I took her into the studio, she hadn't recorded in 30 years, she told me. And uh, it, it had been a long time, and she had never done the overdub thing. Like, all her stuff was completely recorded live and sang live, like they did it in the 50s. So um, it took her a while to warm up, but she totally delivered after she got warmed up. And uh, Wanda's been recording, you know, all the way through. And uh, I, of course, was just thrilled that they both agreed to be on this record because I've been such a huge fan. I've been doing all of their sets lots of their songs off their sets for the last 10 years, you know, before I met them. And so, um, just great. I got to get on a plane, rent a car, and drive right to their houses, sleep at their houses for three nights, hang out with them, get to know them, rehearse these songs so that at the end of the three-day stay, we could go in the studio and record, so. Well, I've had the opportunity to see you play a number of times, always great shows, always energetic shows. Um, God may forgive you, but I won't is always a crowd pleaser. But the show, the song that to me always, it's interesting to look around at the audience and see their reaction is, who's going to fix it now? Uh, oh. A heart, heartwarming song, a Thank touching you. song. Uh, and the audience reaction is sometimes palpable. Yeah, the, there's a few uh, 
dewy eyes at the end of that song. It's a song that I wrote for my father with uh, Don Henry. And it was really a beautiful experience writing that kind of song because it, it really made me cry. when I, I couldn't stop crying when I was working on the chorus. I wonder if we could hear that. You bet. I've had some people leave the room, so get your tissues out, everybody, in front of your living room. <laughs> Let's send this out to my dad, Oscar Flores, and everybody else's dad up in heaven. Jenny, you have a new and exciting project. I do. I'm starting my own label and putting out my first record. And that, uh, and Yay! That, that's good. <laughs> You've declared your independence. I did. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this new CD is recorded live. It is. It's called Single Rose, and it's on Durango Rose Records. Great. By Rosie Flores. Lots of roses in there. <laughs> well, it has been a joy to have you with us. I wonder if you could take us out with a song from the new CD. It'd be my pleasure. 
Um, I thought I'd do this when it's kind of an upbeat song, which we could always use after a, a tearjerker. This is a song that's dedicated to all the gals out there that, that are similar to me, that like to burn incense and, and have aromatherapy stuff around and, and get your cards read and all that stuff. So for the, the new age cowgirl like myself, it's called the Aromatherapy Cowgirl. She's had broken conversations on moonlit nights Tequila stained carpets and barroom fights She shuffles her feet across the desert sand With a Carlos Casanet, a novel in her hand She dances to Buck, Elvis and Merle She's an aromatherapy cowgirl It's another spiritual revelation She's dreaming again about saving the nation Incense, candles, herbs off the vine George Jones and some homemade wine. You can't tell her anything she don't already know. She's Las Vegas lucky man, she's on a roll. She's got a, a California bungalow she calls home. Next to a little honky tonk where she uses a phone. She's a one step, two step, twelve step pearl. She's an aromatherapy cowgirl. So incredible, meditational. Aromatherapy cowgirl. Yeah. Rosie Flores. <laughs> Good to be here. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Yay. Always a pleasure.